Matthew chapter 21, please. Matthew chapter 21. When I invite you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 21. Sure, it's good to see you today. It's a blessing. Singing well, praising our Lord. I commend you for that. I uh, want to give you a preview of tonight. It will be in Acts 11 at 6 o'clock. Um, the church where disciples were first called Christians. The church where disciples were first called Christians. A wonderful account, inspiring one. I believe it will encourage us tonight. Wednesday night we'll be back in Genesis 22 with a message titled Jehovah Jireh. That means God sees and God provides. And a wonderful, wonderful account about Abraham, but truths that reach into our lives today because of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Jireh is still true. Well, more exciting than a Georgia Bulldogs or Atlanta Braves victory parade, and those things are exciting, was Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he rode into town, as we saw last week, on a donkey, which was a sign of peace, a fulfillment of ancient prophecy of God's salvation to his people. And multitudes hailed him, Hosanna, O oh, save! Son of David, Messiah, and the whole city were drawn in amazement to Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. But this was the week of his death. It was the week he would give his life a ransom for many. It was the week that was quickly escalating to the most important historical events of man, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For all the evil to happen to God's Son, the conflict between Him and the Jewish establishment had to reach its climax. And Matthew chapter 21 through 23 is a look at the public confrontation of God's people by Jesus that would lead to that ultimate climax, that ultimate confrontation, that ultimate Jesus has been betrayed to be crucified, and that will be set in motion in Matthew chapter 26. But these next few chapters offer us a lot to think about, because they have a lot to do with God's people who had rejected God's pursuit of them, and the leaders of those people. So may God teach us many things in the weeks ahead. If you'll look at verse 12 of chapter 21, we're not, I said weeks ahead, so we're not working through 21 through 23 today. Now God's people, well, never mind. Verse 12, please. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold, and note this, that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, all of them, the ones who were commercializing God's house, but also the ones who were the consumers of such things in verse 12. He said to all of them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. He was a man. He was God, yet he was a man. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth, henceforward forever. And presently, that means instantly, the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Now, our sermon will cover the rest of the chapter, but I find this encounter with this fruitless fig tree very picturesque of the entire ordeal. And we see this in this chapter. Our title today is this, 
the house of unripe figs. The house of unripe figs. Now, if you were to go back to verse 1 of this chapter, that is a literal, literal rendering or one of the renderings of the word Bethphage in Hebrew where this chapter began. The house of unripe figs is it what it was called. And I feel it is a fitting summary and title of this encounter between Jesus and the Jewish leadership. The house of unripe figs. Yet it's an unfitting description of God's house. Isn't it? The house of unripe figs. Now I don't think a peach farm would stay in business very long. If it was full of decaying, dying or dead peach trees. We took a trip back to McDonough, Georgia a week ago to a peach farm. I don't remember what it was called. Some of you could probably say it off the top of your head. I don't remember. But we went to pick peaches with Pops, Elizabeth's uh, father, and try to make that a yearly thing, picking peaches with Pops. And some friends of ours, and there were lots of peach trees with lots of peaches. And as we made our way through the orchard of peaches, we came to a tree in the midst of the abundantly fruitful trees, and it was totally dead. There were no fruit, there was no fruit on it, there were no leaves on it, it was dried out, it was dead. And I remember asking my friend and his son, I pointed to a living abundant tree and said, which tree do you want to be like? Do you want to be like that one? And then I pointed to the dead one, and I said, do you want to be like that one? Imagine going to a peach farm after reading or watching some fantastic advertisement, only to find when you got there an orchard of dead trees. That'd be disappointing to say the least. What if you went to a peach farm in peach season, and it was open picking season and they had rows and rows and rows of peach trees with leaves galore but no peaches talk about a letdown we want to pick peaches and eat them we have a picture when i candidated here back in august of 2020 we went to a greg farms and amelia was wasn't even two yet she had a peach the size of her face and She's holding that thing. Oh, it's so cute. Richard had it made out on one of those canvas things. We got it up somewhere. I don't know. But man, it's just our little Georgia peach to be sweet. But you want to eat peaches. You don't want the promise of peaches to be disappointed by leaves only. So much like a house of unripe figs, a farm of unripe peaches would be a bummer. I picture Miss Sharon McKenzie, Mrs. Sharon McKenzie, her blueberries. They have some blueberry bushes, or would you call them trees? Bushes. And these bushes, I can picture them starting to leaf out and blossoming, and the season gets closer to the time they're ready to be picked, but there's no blueberries. And the season comes, but there's still no blueberries. And there's leaves there, but there's no blueberries. That would be unpleasant for her. Now, I bring this up for two reasons. One, we aren't super happy about unfruitful fruit trees. But two, God isn't too happy about them either. Yet, how many churches are full of fruitful disciples only to have a fruitless dead tree in their midst? How many Self-professing Christians have leaves on their trees, but no fruit. How many churches promise much to the consumer by way of leaves, but leave everything to be desired because they lack true God-given fruit? As we work through this, I want you to ask yourself some questions. One, am I a lifeless person among vibrant disciples? Now, I, I don't believe we should be of such to take a passage of Scripture and twist it outside of its context to cause someone to question whether they are a believer in Jesus Christ or not. But here we have men who thought they were right with God by their own metric, but God knew the truth. And if you haven't repented and believed the gospel, and yet you have existed in a church, yet dead in your sins without being born again, this could be you today. 
Another question, is the typical American church full of promises to the consumer, yet lacking the produce of Christ's gospel? Third question, is my life as a disciple as disappointing to God as a blueberry bush without blueberries? Last question, is my home, is my family like a farm with unripe peaches? No, kind of started off on a sober gong this morning, but the text started off such a way. God is not pleased with people that are meant to have his life in them, that are meant to produce his fruit abundantly, yet who are like decaying, dying trees. He's not pleased with that. He's not pleased with churches who look productive, yet have no fruit. God's not for a house of unripe figs. Well, why not? Well, we started here that Jesus cursed a fig tree. What happened? He hungered and he saw this fig tree and it had leaves and no figs. And so he said, verse 19, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And immediately it withered away. He cursed a fruitless fig tree so that it immediately withered away. Now, why would Jesus do a thing like that? I remember having a 10th grade substitute teacher. I don't remember his name, but he was an interesting guy. And he said, he used this. I asked him his opinion of Jesus one time and he said, Jesus was a brat, just like that. Jesus was a brat. And he used this as an example. Now, I don't know how that persona fits the overarching context of how Matthew has painted Jesus Christ, so I don't know how that would fit here. Someone might suggest, well, maybe Jesus did this because he was hangry. I mean, he was hungry. It had no fruit. He's the Son of God. I, you know, the tree doesn't have, well, I probably shouldn't say that, doesn't have feelings. Why would Jesus do a thing like that? I want to suggest a couple of things. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson. And we see that immediately. But also there was something bigger going on that this fig tree and its creator illustrated. When the disciples saw this happen, you saw in verse 22, they marveled how soon is a fig tree withered away. And then Jesus used the opportunity to teach his disciples the power of unwavering faith-filled asking in prayer. And he tells them, it's a fact, if you have faith, verse 21, if you don't doubt, he's talking to these people who believed him, if you have faith, don't doubt, you won't only be able to do this which is done to the fig tree and see it wither away like this, and you're amazed by that, but also if you say to this mountain over here, uh, be thou removed from that spot, be cast into the sea, a monumental movement, it shall be done. It shall be done. And his point was not to give a blank check to his disciples to go around and rearrange geography. His point was this, and he said it in verse 22, All things they asked for in prayer, believing they would receive, they had immense ability at their disposal by faith in prayer to see God himself do incredible things. There's a classic book written by a man named John R. Rice called Asking and Receiving. And that is what prayer to our Father in Heaven is. It is asking, it is receiving. And someone might object, well, I asked for this or that, and I believed, but nothing happened. Or things didn't work my way. We need to understand that when Jesus was talking about prayer, there was a certain context that he had taught his disciples about prayer. And this undoubtful believing prayer, this asking and receiving, needs to be determined by what he's already said. First, it's a we thing. Prayer is a we thing. Now, prayer can be a personal thing. I read about Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter 38 this morning when God, or he was sick and Isaiah told him, by God through Isaiah told him, you better get your house in order because you're going to die. And Hezekiah, he rolls over in his bed and faces the wall and starts crying and he begins to ask God, let me live. And God heard the prayer of one person. So the prayer of one person can be fruitful, it can be productive, can be asking, receiving. You know this in your life as a child of God just as well as I do. But primarily when we look at prayer according to the teaching of Jesus, it's a we thing, a we thing because Jesus taught it as a ye thing. Ye in the King James is a plural form of you. It's very specific, ye. And so Jesus taught this. Remember, recall this to your mind, Matthew 6. When ye pray... Say, our Father. Matthew 7, seek 
and ye shall find. Matthew 18, if two or three agree on anything they ask, it shall be done to them of my Father. So prayer is a we thing. Church, prayer is a thy thing. That singular old English way to say you. It's a thy thing. Jesus taught specifics of prayer to the Father, the King of the universe, Matthew 6. How it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. It's a we thing. It's a thy thing. It's a need thing. You go to Jesus in Matthew 6 again on the Sermon on the Mount. He taught them what they needed. They were to pray for our daily bread, our daily needs to just survive. They were to pray for forgiveness as we forgive. They were to pray for deliverance from temptation and evil. I just say all this to explain and teach us that Jesus teaches His disciples, His church, that prayer is powerful when... Disciples pray to their Father together, asking Him for His will to be done in their lives and asking for, asking for things they truly need. Prayer is we really this. We ask Him to align us with Him, not so much getting Him to be our genie. There is power in that kind of praying among disciples and among a church, and more on that to come. So why would Jesus teach a random lesson on prayer right here? And why, a bigger question, why did Jesus curse that fruitless fig tree? And you might be wondering, would he do that to a fruitless person? Would he do that to a fruitless home? Would he do that to a fruitless church, a fruitless nation? What does fruitless even look like? Well, to answer our questions, we're going to have to see how he answered here in the next several verses some questions from the chief priests and elders who saw him cleanse the temple and heal the disease. When he came to the temple and he's teaching, the chief priests and elders, those in charge of the temple, began to question his authority to do the things he was doing. And you see in verse 23, they asked two questions. By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Now, I want to say this. They had a right, a responsibility, to question teachers who were unsanctioned by them and causing a stir. They were responsible for the oversight of God's house. Someone would suggest, well, didn't they let it get out of hand to become this big business thing, this commercialized crazy that kept people from prayer and praise and ultimately from God? We'll get to that. But here we know they asked them of his authority and they had that right. But Jesus, as he often did, answered their questions with questions. You noticed in verse 24 and 25, he basically said if, if these guys would answer him, verse 24, he would tell them by what authority he was doing what he was doing. So he asked a question about the baptism of John. Where did it come from? Did it come from heaven? Did it come from God? Or did it come from man? If you'll answer my question, I'll answer your question. And someone might be wondering, what, what's the baptism of John? Well, for the most part, a Bible reading people understand Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist. He came preaching repentance because the kingdom of heaven was at hand in the wilderness of Judea. And he began to baptize those who would come to him. There were people from all over the place, Jerusalem and Judea and all around the Jordan River that came to be baptized in Jordan confessing their sins, and these very chief priests and scribes sent delegates to John to find out what he was about, and it was obvious that God was bringing people back to himself. It was obvious that God was doing this. And so the answer to Jesus' question in verse 25 should have been obvious to them, yet they sought a diplomatic answer. Don't you like that? On one hand, they didn't want to say from heaven because Jesus would ask them, why didn't you believe him? And they did not believe John. On the other hand, they didn't want to say of men because they feared the people who all believed John to be a prophet sent by God. So they answered, we cannot tell. So they wanted to play games with God, with Jesus. Jesus would not play their game. And he would not tell them, verse 27, you see that, he would not tell them by what authority he did what he did. He would not play games with men who would not believe a preacher sent by God. Now hear me, and we've got to keep rolling. Some men think they can get away with diplomatic answers to the piercing questions of the Son of God. And they say things like this, we don't have to own up to our unbelief, nobody has to know. We don't have to upset those who do believe. 
we can answer with diplomacy. This is what their reasoning is in their hearts. I, I, if there are anything like these men here, and there's nothing new under the sun, we can answer with diplomacy and get our way and slide in under the radar, yet Jesus refuses to play their games. So what does this conversation have to do with Jesus cursing that fruitless fig tree? And what is questioning of Jesus' authority and this diplomatic dancing around, answering his question, have to do with all this? Well, this conversation set Jesus up to remind the leaders of a preacher. A preacher who called them to produce fruit. And an age-old expectation and plan of God himself. And so you see through the next several verses that Jesus gave the chief priests, elders, and Pharisees two parables that confronted their failure to produce fruit. He told two stories that convicted them of their fruitlessness. The first story, you could call it this, a tale of two sons. A father has two sons. Here they are. He has a vineyard. He tells the first son, son, go today in my vineyard. The son says, this might sound familiar to your home, I will not. But then he afterward repents and he goes. The second son, he goes to him and he says, son, go work in my vineyard. And the son, a lot more respectfully it seems, I mean he even said, sir, I go, sir. And he stayed right there. He did not make a move. And so Jesus asked them, verse 31, which of the two did what his father wanted him to do? And their answer was obvious, the first son. And then he brought the story home to these guys because these religious leaders were the second son. You say, who was the first son? Look at verse 31. Jesus said that the publicans, the tax collectors, and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. These people that the religious leaders deemed far from God, cast out of God's kingdom, but according to Jesus, they were the very ones who were entering the kingdom of God before these religious leaders. How could this be? Well, Verse 32, John came in the way of righteousness. When John was preaching and when John was teaching and baptizing those who would repent, he was in the right way and he prepared the way of the Lord. And he spoke of a coming one who would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire and he would separate. This is what he would do. He would separate those of Israel into two groups of people like good fruit that he'd gather into his barn and chaff with dried up shrivelly stuff that he would burn with unquenchable fire. Those who would respond to John's message and Jesus' message and repent, he would gather unto himself the righteous, but those who rejected it would be the wicked and would burn with unquenchable fire. And the men here who claimed to be right with God, I go, sir, did not believe him. And even after John told them, this, now this is important to catch, John told them, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. You better produce, he was saying this to these religious leaders, you better produce fruits that befit, that become, that demonstrate you have repented. And don't think, don't start to think, to say in your heart, I was born a Jew, so, so I'm good, because they would do that. I was born into a Jewish home, so I am right with God because of that. He said, no, you better produce fruits, you better repent and prepare for the coming one, be fruitful, but they did not believe John. So on the other hand, the scum of society did repent and believe John. Their lives were radically changed. And the religious leaders saw what had happened. And even after they saw this repentance by these wicked people, this repentance and this belief, and they're coming to God. That's real fruit. Repentance and faith in the message of God. That's fruit. They saw that and they still did not repent. They saw it happen, but did not repent and believe John. Their outward behavior was, I go, sir. But their actual heart demonstrated no fruits meet for repentance, no turning from themselves, their traditions, their evil, no belief in John's message of this coming one. No repentance, no belief, that's called no fruit. Are you following this? So then Jesus told a second story. And the second parable was a tale of some wicked tenant farmers. Husbandmen, Jesus used the word. You say, what's a tenant farmer? Well, Wikipedia defines a tenant farmer as a person 
a farmer or farm worker who lives on land owned by a landowner, and the landowner contributes land, operating capital, operating equipment, and the tenant farmer, the husbandman, contributes labor, and maybe some of the other things on the side, but primarily labor. So a tenant farmer, a husbandman, is someone who lives and works land owned by another. So let's read from the lips of the Lord about this parable. He said, here another parable, there was a certain householder, landowner, which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower. He fully equipped this thing to produce fruit. And then he let it out to husbandmen, the tennis, tenant, tennis farmers. That maybe they played tennis on the farm. Tenant farmers. And he went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants. They beat one. They killed another. They stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first to receive the fruits, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son because he's reasoning, well, maybe because of who I am and what I've given them, perhaps they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves in their avarice and their greed and their hunger for power and control over what was not theirs. They said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Who agrees? These were wicked tenant farmers. And Jesus even asked the chief priest, he says, When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they even answered, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he's going to let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. They believed that he should, he should mercifully destroy these guys who killed all his servants and who killed his son. And when, when the, the landlord sent them to receive the fruits that he owned, and they killed the servants, they killed the son and they believed that, that these men should be destroyed and that that land should be given to other people who would bring forth the, the fruits. Who would render, he says in verse uh, 41, he'd render him the fruits in their seasons, the fruits that belong to him. Did they even realize what they were saying? You see, they were the ones in charge of God's vineyard. They were the tenant farmers. They were the husbandmen. God often throughout the Old Testament looks at His people as a vineyard. Go read Isaiah chapter 5. Go read Psalm chapter 80 and you will find that He planted a vineyard with full potential to produce fruit called Israel. And He let men, kings and priests and leaders rule over His vineyard. But His vineyard did not produce time and time and time again. His vineyard did not produce the fruit He wanted it to produce. And what was that fruit? It was simply a people of God, humbly repentant and obedient to God. That's simply what it was, believing his word. And he sent servants to collect fruit, didn't he? He sent prophets. He sent preachers in the Old Testament. He sent a preacher by the name of John the Baptist. And what did the leaders do? They killed them or had them killed. And then he sent his own son to these wicked husbandmen, to the chief priests and scribes and elders. And his son asked them, look at this verse 42. Did you never read in the scriptures? We read this this morning, Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Who were the builders of God's house? Who were responsible for God's house? I said earlier, they had the authority to question him because they were responsible. And yet they were rejecting the stone that God was setting up. Who were the husbandmen of God's vineyard? Who was right now in the process of rejecting God's son? They were. God just wanted fruit. He wanted repentant believers and his preachers and the coming one, his only begotten son, but they offered him no fruit. They were builders who rejected their foundation. They were trees that produced no fruit. 
They were the house of unripe figs. In verse 43, Jesus takes that parable, their own words, their own judgment, that those wicked tenant farmers should have the vineyard taken from them and they should be destroyed and this vineyard should be given to another. And Jesus said, look at it, verse 43. He said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, Jews, taken you from you Jewish leaders and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Can I ask you what people were producing fruits of the kingdom of God in repentance and faith? It was the men he was teaching to pray just a little while ago. It was these disciples who had repented when Jesus said repent and believed he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They were his people and they were fruitful, not because they were special in and of themselves, but they were fruitful because they repented and believed the gospel. That's the only reason they were fruitful. But these men, these Jewish leaders, were not because they did not. And look at this verse 44. They would be individually responsible. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Basically means if a man rejects Jesus, trips over Jesus, it's going to mess up his life. He's going to be broken. But there's a day coming when that stone, you go read in the book of Daniel, Jesus is described as this massive stone that's going to come and crush the God-rejecting kingdoms of earth to powder. And individually, if you choose and these men chose to reject Christ at that time you will be ground to powder Jesus cursed the fig tree because he would condemn the fruitless leaders of Israel they looked like they should produce fruit unto God but they were a house of unripe figs now if you believe your Bible and I'm going to get to some application if you believe your Bible God is not done with Israel you go read Romans 9 through 11. You read about the spread of the gospel in Acts to the Jew first. God is not done with Israel, but by and large with the Jews, with the Israeli people. As John said, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received them not. They looked like they should produce fruit unto God, but they were a house of unripe figs, and nothing from this point on after they crucified Jesus, nothing for that nation would ever be the same. And has it? And God's not done with them. He's got a plan. There should be no anti-Semites or anti-anybody in the church of the living God who welcomes all people to Christ. God's not done with them, but the point is they were a house of unripe figs. So let's get to some application here. Get you to your lunch and you can go eat a peach. A fruitless people will wither away. A fruitless people will wither away. I think about a nation, because he talking about a nation here. A nation that is not full of people who have repented and believed the gospel will wither away. And I don't have to tell you, but less and less can it be said of America that America is a Christian nation, though it was founded as one. And more and more, more and more can it be said that by and large, the average man or woman in America is in a miserable, sad, confused mess because a fruitless people will wither away, and a nation that is not predominantly a people of repentant believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they'll be left to their own devices, their own thoughts, and they will wither away. And God judges nations. If we believe the Bible, God judges nations, but God also judges individuals. So a man or woman who will not repent and believe the gospel will break apart and eventually be destroyed. He or she may seem religious, like the second son. They might be respectful to God and Christianity and say, I go, sir. Yet they don't repent. Without repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ, they're fruitless and a fruitless person will wither away. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't think you should be judgmental. I don't think you should judge. It's not right to judge. I'm not, I'm not the judge. There's one judge by the name of Jesus Christ and those who refuse him and his gospel of peace now mess their life up now. And one day he'll return to judge the ungodly with fiery wrath. And those who have rejected him will be cast into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Not my words, Jesus is. He said, he that believeth, believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. In the name of the only begotten Son of God, a fruitless people will wither away. And God can send preacher after preacher to a fruitless individual and point you to his son that, 
you convince yourself, I've said and done all the right things. I was born in the right house. I was born in the right country. I was raised in this. I did the whole baptism thing, and I have attended church, and I've been a member. Yet someone begins to ask you, have, tell me about when you repented and believed the gospel. And you begin to hem-haw around that question. Fruitless people will wither away. A house of unripe figs will fall. People that make church big business, this applies to them. People that commercialize Christianity. I'm not making this up. You read about what was going on in the temple. All external righteousness with internal corruption. All social good without belief in the gospel. A fruitless people will wither away. Now on the flip side of that, a fruitful people will produce fruit. A fruitful people will produce fruit. And in verse 43, look at it again. Jesus spoke of his disciples, his church, when he mentioned a nation bringing forth the fruits of the kingdom. And so a man or a woman who has repented and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ is a person who produces the fruit of the kingdom. And they may feel like they're struggling. And they may feel like they're struggling in life and struggling with faith and need taught and encouraged and need some rebuke from time to time. Yet they are by very nature of their acceptance of Christ. They are a people who are able to produce God's fruit because they've repented and believed God's Son. Disciple, your life doesn't have to be a life of unripe figs. You don't have to be the unripe fig tree. You don't have to be the dead peach tree. You can be a budding fig tree. You can be an abundant peach tree. I think about your home, brother and sister. Your family doesn't have to be a house of unripe figs. So you don't have to have children that become atheists and agnostics and shrivel up their life because they've rejected Jesus. Ma'am, you don't have to have a home where it constantly requires it's this diseased place that constantly needs purged and needs TLC endlessly. You don't have to have that. Your house and family can be a abundant, full of the fruit of the Spirit from the lives of authentic disciples. American churches, they don't have to commercialize or compromise sound doctrine to produce fruit. In fact, someone might argue that the fruit churches, and, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, I'm just trying to think with sound, sound reasoning and a sound mind. If we follow the life of Jesus in His ministry, a crowd didn't always mean a profitable thing in God's work. And churches, someone might argue that the fruit churches might produce by way of crowds, the consumers they welcome aren't always the fruit that God gives, but the product that they manipulated. Emmanuel Baptist Church, we don't have to be a house of unripe figs. We don't have to be, have a hum of activity that keeps people away from real discipleship and fellowship and worship. We don't have to allow shallow expectations of people who claim to be a Christian. Make this house. Well, I guess it's, no, it's not time to go. I'll just keep going, Lord. Make this house. Can I keep going? Can we park here just a little while longer? We don't have to let this house become a den of thieves. We don't have to have the appearance of the house of the living God, yet, pro yet produce no repentant, believing disciples in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has no intent for His people to be a house of unripe figs. Not Emmanuel Baptist Church, not your family disciples, not your life as a disciple. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 15, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Every born-again believer, every gospel-centered family, every church of the living God has has been chosen by God and ordained by God to produce lasting, abundant fruit. And that doesn't happen by making God's house a smorgasbord of consumerism where the customer is always right. And it doesn't happen by stifling true prayer and praise from every age and every generation. And it doesn't happen when we question Jesus' words and His work and His authority and His ways in our lives and our church. It doesn't happen when we say, I go, sir, but then we just live like we just lied. It doesn't happen when truth, gospel truth, is preached and we trip over it without repenting and following Him. So how does it happen? How do we, the fruitful people of God's kingdom, produce His fruit? I want to invite you to John 15. John 15. It's really as simple as Jesus' random lesson on faith and prayer in verses 21 and 22. He told his disciples, don't doubt, have faith, ask together, receive. Why that simple? Well, in John 15, Jesus described himself as a vine and his disciples as branches. And branches produce zero fruit when detached from the vine. He said that 
Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Down in verse, uh, let's see here, down in verse 5, without me you can do nothing. A branch detached from the vine won't produce fruit. Branches struggle to produce fruit when they're close to the ground, when they need cleaned up by the vine. But his words clean them up. And look at this, verse 7, they're called to abide in him. And branches that abide in him, they bring forth, what does it say? They bring forth much fruit. Verse 5, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Well, what does it mean to abide in him? Verse 7, he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, so his words are abiding in you, when you do this, verse 7, ye shall... This sounds familiar. Ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Well, what does it mean to abide in his words? If we abide in him and abide in his words, then we can ask what we will as disciples. It will be done to us. What does it mean to abide in his words? It means keeping his commandments. Well, what were his commandments to his disciples in these chapters in John? Look, he told them, look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Here it is. When disciples of Jesus love other disciples of Jesus, they can pray fruitfully to together, they can be filled with his joy, verse 11, they can bring forth fruit, much fruit that remains, and glorify their Father and truly be known as Jesus' disciples. That's how we are fruitful. I'm going to give you, I'm going to lay this out for you very simply, the path to a fruitful life. It begins when you repent and believe Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again and you receive his forgiveness, his spirit. There is no fruitful life without that right there. And then this happens. You get baptized to show the world, I've believed. And to unite baptism, now stay with me, I'm getting somewhere with all of this. Baptism shows the world, I have believed, and it unites you with a church that bears his name. If there is no baptism, it's like you have leaves without fruit. If there is no uniting with a church, it's like having leaves without fruit. And then once you are there, you obey Christ's commands side by side with those believers of that church and you love them and you pray with them regularly and then you have joy and fruit that remains that only God can give. That's a fruitful life. It's so simple. Now I like to plant a few peach trees on the property. But I was told, Richard told me that if you're going to plant a peach tree on the property, you need two to make it work, to produce thriving, abundant fruit. Why? Because there's cross-pollination that needs to happen. You need more than one peach tree. And now as I was walking through those rows of peach trees in McDonough, Georgia, and there's fruit everywhere, it is amazing to me what God's fruit trees can produce together with more than one. With two or three, or 200 or 300, or 2,000 or 3,000, it doesn't matter. If they abide in Him, they will bring forth much fruit. So this is very simple today. If you're not a believer in Christ, will you repent and believe and get baptized and join our orchard? I want to be very direct. Disciple, you will never, you will never, according to the teachings of Christ in the New Testament, you will never flourish and produce if you're not planted in one of God's orchards. If you are in and out and in and out, how will you receive what you need to thrive? And be fruitful. Emmanuel Baptist Church, abide in Jesus. Fellowship, pray, be a fruitful house.